Good evening. Welcome back to Hope Looks Up Bible Study with Dr. Tom Haney on Tuesday, May 11th, 2021. Tonight we'll be continuing in our study from the book of Proverbs with the title of Taking the Perplexity Out of Proverbs. Proverbs is the best Old Testament example of wisdom literature. Tonight, the lesson is the good of becoming generous and the foolishness of becoming greedy. So we have a number of Proverbs that we're going to be looking at. Uh, so we'll begin with a word of prayer, followed by Dr. Tom Haney. Lord, as we come to study your word tonight, please prepare our hearts to receive the wisdom to be shared from the book of Proverbs. It is good to be reminded that wisdom comes from you as we study these passages. Bless those who are joining us tonight through Zoom and to those who will later view on YouTube. May Tom be led by your spirit in this teaching from Proverbs. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Tom? Amen. And thank you, Chuck. It's so good to see each one of you tonight and to greet you on Zoom. Look forward to greeting you on YouTube and also those of you who follow the text. We are excited that you're listening to the Bible study tonight and hope that you get a great blessing from God because of your listening. God Jehovah is a God that recognizes and warns his people about cause and effect. In fact, in the Bible, there are almost as many verses that start with you shall as commands as start with you shall not. And he continually lists both the blessings and curses that come from obedience and disobedience covering the very same subjects. So we're doing, we take two opposite characteristics that Solomon teaches, the virtue and the vice characteristic, and we see what is the total impact of seeing the good effects and the bad effects of these opposite characteristics. Tonight, we're going to look at generosity, and the contrasting one is greedy, greediness or stinginess. Let's look at first at what it means to become generous. Generosity is something that God commands us to do. It's really not an option if you want to have a contented and blessed life. We don't often look at it that way. We consider generosity to be something that we develop as a wonderful trait, but it's, it is truly something that God asks us to do. And Proverbs 19, 17 says, whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. I want to say that again. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. God regards our generous help to the poor as a gift to himself and blesses the person who blesses the poor. Jesus was very clear in that when he was talking about his great parable of the sheep and the goats. It could have been renamed, actually, the parable of the gen. All the people into the sheep on one side, the right, and the goats on the other side, the left. He will say to those on his right, those who have helped the poor and been generous to the needy, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did for me, Matthew 25, verse 40. It's clearly taught in both the Old Testament, the teaching of Jesus, and all the rest of the New Testament. And when a generous person helps those in true need, he is carrying out the very work of the Lord, and God considers that a personal gift to him. I, I like that. God considers what we do to help the needy as a gift to God himself. Proverbs tells us that great blessings await for those who are generous. Proverbs 22, 9 says, The generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. We spend our time debating whether the poor are truly poor, if they created their own poverty and therefore should not be rewarded with help, or even if they're actually poor. I don't know about you, but I've sat in several Sunday Bible classes where people say, well, the poor in the United States have it better than most of the rest of the world. And I often wondered, so if that's true, would you really be willing to live in the same conditions and situations that they live in, sharing one bathroom with maybe two or three families or some of the other terrible things that people have no vehicles to drive or not enough food to really have adequate food? This idea is so far outside the guidelines that God gives us for us being generous. He tells us where to help the truly poor and give to meet their needs. 
those who are in abject poverty because of the behavior of their parents, or those who are hungry but still employed. In Arizona, St. Mary's Food Bank, or over the world, Salvation Army, or Teen Challenge, or ministries designated and designed to get captured and held young women and also young men out of sex slave trafficking. They don't need our pharisaical scrutiny. They need the generous support of each of us who have plenty and are willing to be generous. The generous person takes up the cause of the wrongly accused and falsely indicted. I didn't realize how common this was in Proverbs until I've been studying for tonight. But really helping the need and helping those who are being prosecuted and tried because of their poverty were almost equal. Proverbs 24, 11 says, rescue those being led away to death. Pull back those staggering towards slaughter. The generous person gives time, effort, <clears throat> legal help, and all they have in their possession to help those who are wronged by the system, or even those who are just being wronged because the person oppressing them has more wealth and influence. Proverbs goes so far to saying that ignorance is not an excuse. Proverbs 24, 12 says, if you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? Now, I began to think about that particular passage. I don't know that I had dwelt a lot about that passage. And I remembered an incident. There were several, but this one was outstanding to me. When I was ministering in Indianapolis, I became very involved in the prison ministry in our town. This was just at the same time that Chuck Colson was starting his ministry, Prison Fellowship. And I was very motivated to become a part of this outreach. We had a federal prison in one of our suburbs in Indianapolis, Fort Bell, located on the east side of Indy. And I recruited several members of the church where I preached, <coughs> Indian Creek. We took a team up twice a month to minister in the prisons. Was there a, met, a man who was very active in the prison ministry in Terre Haute, Indiana? And he invited Sharon and I to come to their home and to share his challenge with me about uh, his ministry. They lived about halfway between Terre Haute and Indianapolis, which I'm guessing was about 40, 45 miles. And they lived right off of Interstate 70 and wanted us to come and have a meal. We had a lovely meal. And after the meal was over, he began his challenge of seeing if I could be able to bring, since I was on the southeast side of Indianapolis, to bring a team down twice a month and minister there on the prison farm. That's where he was a chaplain. But I explained to him that was just a little too long of a drive, about 90 miles to go down and minister in the prison a couple of times a month. And so when I finished, he said, would I come and hold a revival at this prison farm there in Terre Haute? Now, this is not the maximum security prison in Terre Haute. You may realize one of the three strongest prisons in the United States is in Terre Haute, Indiana, but it's right beside it. The, evidently, the people who, when they bought the ground for the prison, some of the farmers around, some of it was government money, some of it was, uh, was people donating, but they gave a lot of the farm ground right around the maximum security prison and made a farm prison out of it where low-key prisoners or certainly not high security risks could come and could farm and be involved in agriculture, learn some skills and so on. In fact, the man I talked to had only been in the maximum security prison three times. There is no chaplaincy program allowed in the federal maximum security prison in Terre Haute. They consider it too dangerous for volunteers, chaplains to be involved. So they have a couple of guys who are paid by the government so you probably know the depth of their spiritual commitment. I shouldn't judge that, but you know it's kind of true. Every time the state takes over something spiritual, it ends up being non-spiritual people doing it. And uh, they just stay in offices and see the men as needed in their office. He'd only been allowed in there three times, and every time was to give some testimony about either someone who had, he'd come in contact with on the farm or someone he had come in contact in the community outside of prison. I said, sure, I'd be glad to come and hold a revival for the farm prison in Terre Haute. I knew this would just be a gift to their ministry. They were not flush with funding. They had not attracted many generous givers, and the man and his wife often supplemented the ministry from their own accounts. I was surprised about two things that happened with this revival at the farm prison. 
The chapel we held the revival in was only a few hundred yards from the massive prison walls that the maximum security prison had. So walking into the chapel or out of the chapel every night of the revival, it was a, a little ominous to see those giant walls, the huge lights, the shiny barbed wire, razor thin across the walls and all the things that were there uh, to keep the prisoners from escaping. But it didn't keep us from having a tremendous revival. We had over 35 men get baptized that week. It was one of the most successful one week revivals I'd held up to that point in my ministry. But here are the two surprises. Surprise number one, the men wanted to worship. I had not seen that kind of spiritual energy since I ministered in the island of Barbados in my first ministry. They didn't want the sermon to quit. In fact, if they thought you were trying to get to the invitation, they would just start clapping until you would start preaching again, <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny. Clap till you preach instead of clap because you are preaching. It just, it just hit me as pretty, pretty uh, humorous. And they responded with open hearts and open minds. They continued on into the night. I know I got home after the first night of the revival about 1.30 in the morning. I woke Sharon up and she said, where in the world have you been? I said, well, you wouldn't believe it, but the revival went into overtime. I said, <laughs> we, we were having a fantastic time with the, with the revival. And I said, uh, so uh, after that, I did try to, to leave each night uh, a little quicker than that, but I was filled and blessed. But the second thing is the one I wanna really talk to you about. More surprising, we'd had a legal battle over our building permits for at Indian Creek Christian Church. We bought a section of farm ground. It had a small stream in front of the, of the property. And as you came off of the road, you, you crossed uh, into the property, which was, a lot of that was a flood zone over this little stream and back to where we wanted to start the building. So we've been delayed for months in the, in the permitting offices of Maricopa County. And the other concern of, of fighting that, literally the city of Indianapolis, was suddenly lifted off. The week after that revival, we were notified that the city had decided in the church's favor, we were finally cleared by the city to begin our final survey of the land and start our building project. And I bring that up simply because I want us to realize that's what Proverbs said. He says, even if you're unaware of what happens when you help those who are needy and you help those who need that service, when you become generous in your time, your talent, uh, or other things that you can offer, God will bless that. Even though I didn't know, God knew. I had no idea that either result would happen when I said, yes, I'll do the revival, but God did. And to those who were generous with time, talent, and funds, God gives his great blessings because he does repay those who do his work generously. It could have been a generous act done on purpose or a generous act done really out of ignorance as far as knowing what God was gonna do, but he will reward both. God loves and blesses generous people. Now let's take a look at what Proverbs says about becoming greedy or stingy. Proverbs says that a greedy or stingy person will not get much help when they have a need. Uh, this is a really, emphatic proverb. It's Proverbs 21, 13. It says, whoever shuts their ears to the city of the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be answered. It's amazing that our drive for wealth and the need to feed the greed has led to so many neglectful attitudes towards family. Several people were appalled seven year, several years ago when an enterprising family in Japan started a business called Rent-A-Family. The business was directed towards the elderly who were lonely because their families ignored them in their pursuit for wealth. The agency offered a stand-in family that visits these elderly people for a few hours, acts like a real family. You can pay for one time a month, two times a month, up to four times a month. At the time when they started it, the four times a month was $1,000 per month. The president of Rent-A-Family said, there are a lot of people who feel lonely because everyone is chasing money and no one pays attention to the human need for love and acceptance. Mrs. Suzuki, a retired doll maker from the area where this ministry was offered, a retired doll maker, rented a family. And she wrote about it and said, from the bottom of my heart, I felt as though they could be my family. I know they're not my real family, but there was a real feeling of warmth. How sad. 
older people pay younger people to give them a little attention because their own families ignore them. I think what Proverbs said is so true. Do you think these neglectful sons and daughters will have a lot of success in getting their children to visit them when it's no longer to their children's advantage or profit to come and see them? Proverbs says that we can become so greedy and stingy that God can step in and demand our life. This seemed a little ominous to me. Proverbs 22, 23, and 24 says, Do not exploit the poor because they are poor. Do not crush the needy in court, for the Lord will take up their case and will exact life for life. But you know, back in that same parable that Jesus taught about the sheep and goats or the generous and the stingy, Jesus says that when he returns, he'll also address the goats. Here are those who are the greedy and selfish and will say to them, depart from me, you were cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, because you never came and gave me any help. Jesus closes that parable by saying to the goats, true or stingy, the greedy, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. Proverbs 29, 14 says, if a king judges the poor with fairness, his throne will be established forever. So that proverb clearly teaches that even kingdoms rise and fall based on whether the leaders are generous or greedy. Although once again, just like last week with the wise and foolish, you're probably thinking, who in their right mind would ever want to be greedy and selfish? The answer is many people choose this path on purpose and pursue it with all their might. Unless you're so magnanimous in your generosity that you catch the world's attention, the world pays almost no attention to what you're doing in the area of generosity. It highlights the 500 health, 100 wealthiest men and women in Forbes, not the 500 most generous men and women in Forbes. The list of billionaires published each year starts and ends with only those who have accumulated at least $1 billion. And although people often give lip service to how much the small gifts mean in helping charitable drives, the names on the buildings, the ribbon cutters, and even the ones who are listed on the plaque right inside the door are usually those who have given the most. Our world honors the greedy and selfish and usually only honors the generous when the generosity seems to fly right in the face of the worship of greed. It's just so overwhelming, you have to acknowledge it. The widow who gave all the money she had that Jesus pointed out, the two mites or pennies, and was honored by Jesus. Would she be granted much adulation and praise in our society? Would the person who turned down the high paying job to work for small wages and make a big impact ever be honored? Except maybe that little human interest story they tuck at the end of 60 minutes or the end of the hour long newscast. Our world is built on the concept of greed and selfishness and very few people get out of that rat race. Once again, this list of ways the world encourages greed and selfishness could go on and on because the world is bought into the idea that it thinks up and has called them the right ideas. And greed destroys. It destroys both the poor who suffer under the direction of the greedy, but it also destroys the greedy because those on a power trip, even if it's only on a money power trip, will be destroyed by what they worship unless it's truly God. Now, I listed several scriptures for you to take time to to read before tonight, and we're going to take those on right now. And I want to, as I read the scriptures, if you want to follow along in your Bible and you have them there, we're going to start with Proverbs 3, 27 through 30. And we're going to see the comparisons that Solomon makes about generosity and greediness or selfishness. Proverbs 3, 27 through 30 says, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due, when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, Come back tomorrow and I'll give it to you when you already have it with you. Do not plot harm against your neighbor who lives trustfully near you. Do not accuse anyone for no reason when they have done you no harm. The Proverbs are very clear. Those who know that they should be generous and yet who are not generous are actually doing evil towards God. The idea here is to do all the good that you can do when you can do it. The neighbor in the Bible is not someone whose property touches your property or lives only a few houses down or on your block. No, in the Bible, the neighbor is anyone in need that God brings across down your block. Remember when Jesus told this story about the Good Samaritan? 
when he was finished, he said, who was a neighbor to the man who got robbed and injured? Had nothing to do with the Samaritan living near that man. It didn't have much to do with the priest or the Levite or the wealthy person who lived, if they lived next to that man. It had to do with the fact that someone in need was brought near and the Samaritan was the one who was the neighbor. He was the one who helped. This includes false legal action against someone. It's clear that the generous person will always take the high road in relationships, while the greedy person will do whatever it takes to part someone from their money or property and claim it for themselves. Proverbs even compares the two traits at times, generous and greedy. And Proverbs 11:17 is a great comparison. It says, those who are kind benefit themselves, but the cruel, we could substitute stingy or, or greedy, bring ruin on themselves. The results are so clear. The kind, generous person blesses everyone, even themselves. But the greedy and selfish, here called cruel, actually cause their own demise and ruin. And then Proverbs 11, 24 through 26, even gives the principle of how that works. Now we've heard this scripture a lot of times, but it's clearly in this same area. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly. In other words, they know they have it and could give it, but they don't, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will also be refreshed. This is still the proverb. People curse the one who hoards grain, but they pray God's blessing on the one who's willing to even sell it. So even in the times of drought, remember all the children of Israel, Joseph bringing all of his family, only 71 at that time, but all of his family down to Egypt because Egypt was willing to sell grain while the rest of the world only hoarded what they had. The results are obvious. The generous person actually receives more than they had before they started being so generous. But the one who is stingy and greedy will actually end up in poverty. Now, I think sometimes we miss the idea. It's not necessarily that that person dies a pauper. Maybe it's just that they passed and they took none of it with them. So with no righteous deeds going before them, remember Jesus said, don't lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust and thieves and so on can come in and steal or corrupt, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust and, and thieves cannot break in, cannot, cannot do anything to it. You see, well, their gods of money and wealth that they worshiped are gone. So they literally ended up poor. They go to heaven without a single treasure laid up in heaven before them. Each year, thousands of people visit the renowned Hearst Castle on the West Coast, the home of the fabulously wealthy William Randolph Hearst. He accumulated over 3,500 Egyptian statues, medieval Flemish tapestries, and century-old hand-carved ceilings, and some of the greatest artwork of all time. He built a house that was 72,000 square feet to put his stuff in. He acquired property for his house. 265,000 acres, and he at one point owned 50 miles of the California coast on the Pacific. He collected stuff for 88 years. Then you know what he did? He died. Yep, that's right, he died. You know how much William Randolph Hearst left behind? That's right, everything. <laughs> he left all of it behind. Proverbs 12.10 says, the righteous care for the needs of their animals, but the kindest acts of the wicked are cruel. The idea of being generous or greedy even affects the way you treat, I guess today we'd say pets, although in the Bible it was more your co-workers, the oxen, the, the mules, the animals that you are having help do your farming. But here's a very interesting thing I want us to catch. The selfish person, here called wicked, never does anything that is not self-serving. Now you can see why God considers them his enemy. Proverbs 14, 21 says, it's a sin to despise one's neighbor, but blessed is the one who is kind to the needy. And although that contrast in the proverb does not seem readily clear, talking about a neighbor and then talking about needy, and you say, well, none of my neighbors are, are very needy. It is, it is clear. The source of greed and selfishness is the lack of concern and love for others but the generous one will always be kind. 
by meeting needs and defending rights of the poor and the needy, and God will bless them. The same chapter of Proverbs goes on to say in verse 31, whoever oppresses the poor allows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. The contrast of the greedy and generous points out the very basic thought of Proverbs. Greedy behavior and actions mean you have God against you. You have God against you because you're not respecting his creation. And the generous behavior and actions mean God is right beside you, blessing you all the way. Proverbs 25, 21, and 22 says, If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Proverbs tells us that generosity is the only way that you can convince an enemy that he no longer needs to be your enemy. Now, it doesn't say it will always happen, but it's the only way it can happen. Jesus took this very scripture about being generous to your enemy, and in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 43 through 48, he says this is the attitude of a disciple of Christ, being a generous person. It's the way you're to act and to think towards those who are your enemies. I'd like to sum up the teaching of Proverbs on becoming generous versus becoming greedy or selfish with this proverb. Proverbs 28, 27, it's a remarkable one. It says, those who give to the poor will lack nothing, but those who close their eyes to them receive many curses. The false pride of humanity is exceptional. And many stingy, greedy people looking back on their life have said, I wouldn't change a thing. However, I want to ask myself, Will they still feel that way when they stand before the maker and he points out to them, they laid up no treasures in heaven. He didn't even know them. Uh, they don't have a home in heaven and they don't have a place waiting. That arrogance, that pride, that selfishness continues on many times even in the attitude. While many generous people looking back at their lives have often said, I wish I could have done more. I wish I could have helped more people. I wish I could have expanded my ministry to a, to a greater number. The generous will live a full life, while the greedy will live a life that only seems good to them, and sometimes not even good in their own eyes. It's amazing that Proverbs teaches us such a clear and simple truth that is not honored by a majority of our world. The generous live a more blessed and happy life than the greedy, because the greedy have constant corrections from God. God is constantly goading them to get them to be not be greedy, takes away some stuff or disappoints them or their plans don't all follow through because God is in that effort trying to get them to become uh, close to him and generous people. I have three takeaways I hope you remember about our comparison of the generous life and the greedy life as taught in Hebrews tonight. Number one, generous people are doing what God wants and greedy people are misusing the wealth that God gave them. I like the fact that Proverbs never says how generous is generous. Some people can be very generous with money and they're not really being generous. It's money they'll never need, never use, never have. Many of those very same people are not very generous with their time because their time is very precious to them and they use their money to buy off obligations so they have the time all to themselves. The same is true with some who have time. They're not working, they're not doing this, they're not doing that, so they're very generous with their time. But they hold on to every penny they ever make and don't help give that to anybody who can really use it. So generous people are doing what God wants. Greedy people are misusing the wealth that God gives them. Second, generous people will receive blessings. Greedy people will receive curses. I think that's very important for us to realize. Generous people receive blessings, and it may be a blessing you don't even realize at the time. My feeling is people that are generous with their children receive much more accolation and love and care from their children than others. I know our oldest daughter is, our youngest daughter has told us many times, mom and dad, when you get older, we're gonna take care of you because you always had grandma live with us and then you had the other grandma come out and stay two months with us. And I say the same thing to them every time I say, okay, that is fine. You can say that to mom and promise that to her. She's little and petite. But if I'm not ambulatory, there is no way you're going to take care of me. I don't want you to have breakdowns of your physical life and hernias 
trying to lift this big old guy around. You stick me in a home and come see me. That will be just fine for me. But, but I'm telling you, our children, our children see our generosity. And they want to duplicate that in their lives if they're believers. They want to duplicate that same generosity we offered as it goes on. But they also know greediness. You know, the cat's in the cradle, the old song. Uh, I think we all remember that one pretty well about the dad that never had any time for his son. And when dad was now in his older years and son was making a fortune, son had never no time for dad. Uh, people, generous people will receive blessings. May not be the same blessing, may not always be financial, but it'll be blessings that enrich your life and make you feel good. Greedy people will receive curses. And third one, generous people have God on their side. We need, to, we need to remember that. When you're generous, you're doing God's work. So you have God on your side. And greedy people actually make God their enemy because God is trying to constantly get them back into a right relationship with their possessions and their material goods. The one with the most toys at the time of death is not a winner. That's foolish, or as we were looking last week, anti-Bible, anti-the-word thinking. The true winner is the one who has been generous all the times they could. They have truly laid up for themselves treasures in heaven. Be careful of the allure of worshiping money and material goods. We need to realize they get shuffled around often. But long to be a generous person who helps the poor and the needy. There has not been a war in this world that has not shuffled the wealth of the world. There hasn't been recessions. There hasn't been uh, terrible times of regression that has not done the same. All of the material goods and money get shuffled on a continual basis. And with death, many times they get shuffled down through a series of other generations. Long to be a generous person who helps the poor and needy, who has an account in heaven that nobody ever takes anything out of. God keeps for himself and knows that your generosity is blessed by him. Solomon makes it pretty clear for a man who is extremely wealthy, doesn't he? Happiness is not in wealth. Happiness is in generosity because God inhabits generosity and he blesses it when he sees it in us. Next week, we will be on a one week break as the uh, pastor doesn't trust himself of being able to pull Zoom off in California by himself. So uh, we'll take a one week break on May 25th. We're gonna study, I think a virtue vice comparison of what Proverbs teaches that I'll kind of knock your socks off. I think it will, it will absolutely amaze you now about the amount of control Proverbs says we have over the two characteristics, becoming joyful and becoming angry. Uh, and Proverbs con contrasts those uh, quite a bit. So in two weeks, uh, we'll start out joyful. No, no, no. In two weeks, we will uh, we'll have that, uh, that contrast. Thank you for joining us tonight. At this time, I'd like to turn our Bible study back over to our host, Chuck Eaton. Chuck? Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, I don't know. It's good to be reminded that being generous is a better better way to go if you have the choice, at least. So uh, thank you for that. And we're going to go right into our, our prayer time, and Linda will take that over. So here we go, Linda. Oh, you want to get everybody up one second. Oh, there they are. Okay. And if everybody would unmute. So I see your pretty faces, but I can't hear your pretty voices. We gotta sh shut the recording. Hold on a sec. <laughs> 